Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is February 20th, 2024, and this is part three of my prophetic warning to the mountains of Israel. The mountains of Israel are the overcomers of God, the Kodeshim of God, the holy ones of God. This one is also called the sins of Job. I had made copious notes for this, uh, basically from Job chapter 32 to 37, but instead I'm going to read directly from the scripture and I'm going to rely upon the Holy Spirit to bring to my recollection that which I need to speak. You will recall uh, the story of Job. You, you, I assume, understand the basic uh, beginning of that. If you don't, go back and read chapter 1 and chapter 2. And then after Job is basically totally destroyed, his family has been killed, all of his wealth has been taken, and his health then is totally destroyed, uh, his wife says, curse God and die. And Job says, don't be a foolish woman. And then his three friends, his three best friends come to comfort him. Well, of course, it's the comfort of most friends. Job, obviously you're a sinner, and that's why God has judged you. Uh, and Job is incensed by that because that is not the kind of life that he lived. <clears throat> so that's the basic background. And then uh, for up until chapter 32, you have this dialogue between Job and his three friends. <clears throat> Finally, when you get to chapter 32, you have a new character appear. So I'll start reading here with chapter 32. <clears throat> so these three men, his friends, ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the family of Ram, burned with anger. He burned with anger at Job because Job justified himself rather than God. He burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, he burned with anger. You go back to the beginning of this passage in, in chapter 32, and it, it begins by showing you what Job's main sin was. He was righteous in his own eyes. That's verse 1. And then... Elihu was mad at Job because, it says, Job justified himself rather than God. So that's the root of Job's sin, self-righteousness, and that he justified himself rather than God. Now, Elihu picks up this theme in the next chapter, in chapter 33, verse 9. He says this, he says, You, Job, say, I am pure, without transgression. I am clean, and there is no iniquity in me. There is no sin in me. And then you say, Behold, God finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy, me in whom there is no sin. See, Job was outraged. He was, he was outraged. He puts my feet in stocks and watches all my paths. Why? So he can hurt me. So... Job is mad at God. Behold, says Elihu, in this you are not right. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. God is greater than you, Job. Why do you contend against him? Saying, he will answer none of man's words. Now that idea of contention to contend with God means that you must rise above him in order to talk to him. Then, because you contend with him, because you've risen above him, you rebuke and judge him. To contend, the word to contend means to struggle to surmount. To surmount means to stand or be placed on top of. That's what Elihu is accusing Job of doing. Now, does that remind you of anything? See, this is where the revelation began for me. 
what is this really talking about? What, what is this saying Job is doing? Where do we see this happen in Scripture, or do we, do we see it at all? Well, I think we see it in many places, and the, I've chosen three that we're going to look at. Let's go to the first place that we really see this, and that's Genesis chapter 11. So turn there, Genesis chapter 11, and uh, <clears throat> very, very famous. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, so man evidently was created, or the Garden of Eden was evidently in the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Shinar is the land of Babylon. Chaldea, Fertile Crescent. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, now here's the key, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, here's the key, this is 11 verse 4. So the men at this time, from the whole earth, because everyone was together now, there, there was only one language in the earth at this time. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city. <clears throat> Do you ever wonder what city that was or is? Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Four things there. <clears throat> First, mankind of one language wanted to build themselves a city. Now we know later on in this that God came down, destroyed their tower, and confused their languages, and the place was called Babel. This is the origin of Babylon. Babylon. Babylon the Great. This is the city of man. It's, this, it's the great city. This is man's kingdom. Babel, Babylon the Great. So that's the first thing. Let us build ourselves a city. So they wanted to build the city of man. They did not seek the city of God. And also, let us build a tower with its top in the heavens. Well, who is in the heavens? God. So what were they doing? They wanted to raise themselves above God. See, they wanted to be the authority. They did not want to submit to God's authority. They wanted to be the authority. And <clears throat> let's talk about Mike Bickle a little bit. Who wanted to be the authority? Does Mike want Jesus to be the authority? Or does he want to be the authority? Like um, a David who has a, an authority to defile women. Is that what he wanted to be? Who wanted to be the authority? Who did Mike want to be the authority? Did he want Jesus to be the authority? Or did he want to be the authority? He stood in the place of God. That's Mike Bickle's sin. In place of Christ is Antichrist. That's why his sin is so utterly serious. And why all of you people who submitted to him need to do everything you can now to make things right. So, two things. They're going to build the kingdom of man, which is a satanic kingdom, not a godly kingdom, not a holy kingdom. Number two, they wanted to raise themselves over God. They wanted to be greater than God. Number three, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They were not interested in Christ's name. They don't care about their new name. Remember I read to you earlier today from uh, Book of Revelation, Chapter 3, the Church of Philadelphia. God will give the overcomers a new name. Jesus will give them a new name. Overcomers care about Christ's name. Overcomers care about the name that Christ will give them. Overcomers are not antichrist. Overcomers do not put themselves in the place of Christ like the entire church does. That's the difference. <clears throat> and number four, we're going to do this because we don't want to be dispersed over the whole earth. We want to decide our future. We don't want God to decide the future for us. 
I want to decide because I'm going to ascend over God and I'm going to make the decision. Okay. Do you see, that's what Elihu is accusing Job of doing. Do you see how serious that is? Oh, it's utterly serious because that's the sin of Mike Bickle. That's the sin of IHOP. That's the sin of all the leaders of IHOP. That's the sin of the church, of all the church. That's the sin. That's the danger for the overcomer. Do not exalt yourself over God. Humble yourself before the Lord your God. <clears throat> That's the first example. Now let's go to the second one. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, very, very interesting verse. And everybody knows this from the King James versions of the Bible. In fact, I think I'll look it up in the King James version here. Isaiah 14, verse 12, King James Version. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut? cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. <clears throat> In the English Standard Version, it says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who lay the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, the most high God. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. <clears throat> That's verses 12 to 15 of Isaiah 14. Now, do you see how that is exactly the sin of Babel. That's exactly what those men at Babel did, isn't it? It's exactly the same sin. And now let's go to another place where we see this same sin. This is Ezekiel 28. It's easy to remember because 28 is double 14. 14 times 2 is 28. So you have one example in Isaiah 14. <clears throat> First example is Genesis 11, then you have Isaiah 14. And now we're going to go to Ezekiel 28. Now, <clears throat> Ezekiel 28 starts like this, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord I am. Because your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a man, and no God, though you make your heart like the heart of a God. Are you indeed wiser than Daniel? No secret is hidden from you. By your wisdom and your understanding you have made wealth for yourself, and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries by your great wisdom in your trade, you have increased your wealth, and your heart has become proud in your wealth. Therefore, thus says the Lord I am, because you make your heart like the heart of a God. Therefore, behold, I will bring foreigners upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit. And you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas. That means among mankind. Will you still say, I am a God, in the presence of those who kill you? Though you are but a man and no God, in the hands of those who slay you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised. 
the uncircumcised in heart. You shall die the death of those who do not believe in God. By the hand of foreigners, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God, I am. This is the sin of Job, who was raising himself above God. He did that by believing that he had the right to accuse God and correct God. In doing that, he lifted himself higher than God. He became God's counselor, God's teacher, God's ruler. Do you see how serious that sin of Job is? That is the sin of Job. And we will look at that now in detail. So Elihu clearly discerns where Job is coming from. Going back to Job chapter 33, starting in verse 9. Job, you say, I am pure without transgression. I am clean, and there is no iniquity in me. There is no sin in me. Behold, God finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in stocks and he watches all my paths. Behold, Elihu says, in this you are not right. I'll answer you, for God is greater than man. Why do you contend against him? Why do you lift yourself above him like the men at Babel did, like uh, Lucifer did, like the king of Tyre did. Why do you lift yourself above God, he says. Why do you contend with God, saying, he will answer none of man's words? For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. See, God speaks to us all the time, but we don't understand it. <clears throat> sometimes in a dream, sometimes in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon a man, while they slumber on their beds, then he opens the ears of men. Do you pray that God will open your ears? Father, I pray you will open our ears to hear even now. As your Holy Spirit speaks, open our ears to hear. God speaks in one way and two and more. Though man does not perceive it, in a dream and a vision of the night, speaks when deep sleep falls on men as they slumber on their beds. He opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings that he may turn man aside from his deed. God speaks to us to turn us aside from our evil deeds <clears throat> and conceal pride from a man. He, he, he keeps back his soul from the pit. God does these things to keep our soul from death, from the abyss, to keep his life from perishing by the sword. Man is also rebuked with pain on his bed rebuked with pain. Well, I've been rebuked with a lot of pain and with continual strife in his bones so that he, his life even loathes bread. You know, I didn't even realize how sick I'd become because I was, I was at the point where I couldn't eat for a while. I would take one bite of food and then that was all I could eat. I just didn't have any appetite. And that was, that was within the last three weeks. That all changed within three weeks. <clears throat> so that his life loathes bread, and his appetite the choicest food. His flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. His soul draws near the pit to the abyss, and his life to those who bring death. If there be for him an angel, a mediator, one of the thousand to declare to man what is right for him, and he is merciful to him and says, deliver him from going down into the pit, I have found a ransom. This is speaking of the Melchizedek priesthood and Jesus, our ransom. Let his flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then man prays to God and he accepts him. He sees his face with a shout of joy and he restores to man his righteousness. He sings before men and says, I sinned and perverted what was right and it was not repaid to me. He has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit 
and my life shall look upon the light. Well, that's how I felt after I received the letter from my father <clears throat> about 18 days ago. Now let's go down to uh, Job 34, verse 7. What man is like Job, who drinks up scoffing like water? Job was scoffing who travels in, com in company with evildoers and walks with wicked men. Job, a scoffer, traveling with evil men and walks with wicked men? For he has said, it profits a man nothing that he should take delight in God. Therefore hear me, you men of understanding. He's talking to Job and his three friends because his three friends, Job's three friends could not answer Job. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. See, that's ultimately what Job was accusing God of, was doing wickedness, was treating him wrongly. He was, Job was accusing God of sinning. God sinning? You know, the sins of Job started with self-righteousness, and lifts himself above God, accuses God of sinning, scoffs at God. Okay... For according to the work of a man, he will repay him, and according to his ways, he will make it befall him. Truly, God will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him charge over the earth, and who laid on him the whole world? In other words, come on, guys. Who appointed God ruler of the world? Did you? Is that what you're saying, Job, by lifting yourself above God that you appointed God ruler of the world? <clears throat> if he should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. In other words, if, if God wanted to, he could just put an end to this. If you have understanding, hear this. Listen to what I say. Now catch this next one. This is chapter 34, verse 17. Shall one who hates justice govern? In other words, if God hated justice, if God was not dealing justly, even with Job, could he even govern? Could he even govern the earth? Would he have authority to control the earth if he hated justice? He's saying, how ridiculous are your thoughts, you silly old men? Will you condemn him? who is righteous and mighty, who says to a king, worthless one and denobles wicked men, who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. In a moment they die, at midnight the people are shaken and pass away, and the mighty are taken away by no human hand. For his eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. There is no gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves. And then he says this, and this is so profound. <clears throat> Verse 23, 34, 23. For God has no need to consider a man further that he should go before God in judgment. That's kind of a mysterious verse. Here's what it means. If you think like Job, if you lift yourself above God, if you put yourself in the place of God. If you contend with God, God has no need to consider you any further. Not even so much as that you should even come before him in judgment. 
In other words, you are so wrong that you can't even come before God in judgment yet. You haven't gotten to the place yet where God can begin to deal with you according to what you need. See, our whole perspective of God has to change. We have to believe that God is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. We have to believe that God is God and not me. I am not God. I did not create this earth. I can't create a thing. Jesus said, I can't turn one of my hairs gray. He turned a lot gray, but I can't turn one gray. I can't create anything. I can't heal somebody of their sickness. I can't make a leg grow. I can't make an ear grow if it was cut off. And so if you set yourself up above God, you haven't even gotten to a place yet to come into his place of judgment. I mean, he you can't even come before him in any way. Let me read that verse again so that it, it brings light to you. If you're like that, if you're like Job, or the way I was, where, where I was mad at God, because I could not understand why I was two and a half years in sickness. I thought like Job that I was living a righteous life. Self-righteous. Oh, self-righteous. I said, God, and, and I remember saying, God, come and talk to me. I, I need to talk. I want to talk to you. I did the same thing as Job. Exactly the same thing. Listen to me. See, that's so wrong-headed. If you're like that, verse 23, Job 34, 23. If you're like that, like Job was, like I was, like Mike Bickle is, and so many are, if you're like that, God has no need to consider you further. Why should he? He has no need to consider that you come before him for judgment because if he allowed you to come before him in judgment, you're done. You have no recourse. You, you have no hope. You have no hope. You see how serious this is? And we'll continue in the next video seeing how serious it is. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, give us a heart of repentance. We know you are coming soon. Father, let us be ready. Prepare us to be ready for what's coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.